So, uh, what kind of computer ran the first web server? Anyone? Oh, I heard a next cube from over here. That is the correct answer. Give the man a round of applause while he gets his mouse pad and <laughs> t-shirt. So, question number two for a book on PCI compliance from uh, Singress. Uh, what Outlook macro virus was the first to infect a million computers? <laughs> I'm sorry, it says Melissa, but the person that said Outlook. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I'm giving it to the guy that said Outlook. <laughs> I think that was. He's not coming forward, so Melissa can have it. <laughs> So, are the AV folks ready That's in the back? Are there AV folks in the back? Hey, there aren't any AV folks in the back. We'll deal with that. So, um, now I present to you uh, Michael Weigand. He is going to give you, uh, well, a talk on building your own Predator UAV. Give him a round of applause. Good afternoon, Shmukon. Is my mic working? Everybody hear me? Awesome. All right, so today, again, building your own Predator UAV at 99.95% .95 discount. Um, before I really get started with the presentation, I just want to give you a little demo. Uh, just yesterday, we took the uh, plane out in front of the hotel. Bellhop gave us a really strange look. And uh, we put it up about two hours after the snow started falling. So uh, let's see if we can show you the video we hashed together. So you can see the uh, hotel right there. We're kind of going around to the back. Let's get a look down. I personally wanted to get a shot of Bruce uh, in his snowshoes, you know, trekking around outside, but I don't know if we caught him or not. Weather front interference. All right, snow's starting to look heavy now. Let's roll out. <laughs> off target, off target. So the RF link admittedly was absolutely terrible. I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't really tell what was going on. I blame that entirely on the snow and all the embassies with their jammers in the area because I have never seen anything so bad in my life before. That's a really quick... Um, just the, I got to give the standard disclaimer. I am a kid out at the United States Military Academy, which means I'm 21. I don't really know a lot. I'm just a student. So uh, I have to give this, uh, this disclaimer that every, anything I say or do up here uh, doesn't represent the, the Army, DOD, West Point. All this information used at your own risk. Just like anything, it can be used for, uh, for profit or gain or for some pretty terrible things if you put your mind to it. So uh, don't, don't come looking at me afterwards. Okay, everybody's seen the MQ-9 Reaper or the Predator drone. This is a picture I found on the internet of it uh, in some sandy environment. Unfortunately, I, the title of the talk is a little misleading. This is the actual plane up here today that I'm going to show you how to make. And uh, it's not quite a Predator, I'm sorry. It doesn't have the cool missiles on the bottom and it, it doesn't fly for 20 hours, but... Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's right. I haven't installed them for this demo because that would look a little sketch, but uh, you can do what you like. So uh, real quick introduction to UAVs and autonomous technology. Autonomous basically essentially means a, a self-governing. It's a robot that makes its own decisions. It's independent of human interaction. Um, the best thing about autonomous systems is that when applied to aerial vehicles, we actually have taken the technology uh, pretty far so far. With ground robots, you have to take in a consideration of the environment and sensing, obstacle avoidance, and all this other jazz. And when we put a plane up in the sky, we know we got to deal with, uh, you know, with the fluid that it's coming through the air. The weather, obviously, can be a problem like we found out yesterday. But it's actually a lot easier to uh, make autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles when we're dealing with airspace instead of ground space, um, or in some cases, sea space. So a lot of the autonomous technologies that we see out there all the advanced stuff has been created predominantly for aerial systems. 
Now, some of this has matriculated down to the hobbyist level where my budget kind of comes into play. Um, and so I'm going to you know, kind of demonstrate where the current status of this technology is, how you can go out, assemble the parts, and uh, you know, put a pretty cool system together and apply it for your own, uh, your own needs. So the marketplace, just a quick overview of uh, where UAV systems fall, uh, especially when you want to go out and buy your own autopilot and put it in a, a model. Um, in the red uh, box you see up there, these are commercial vendors, Micropilot, Proctorus, UNAV, Cloudcap. They sell basically ready-made autopilot systems that you can integrate in anything from a Cessna to a little tiny you know, a hobby foam plane like I have in front of me here. These systems can range in cost anywhere from 1000 to $30,000. And if you pay these guys enough money, they'll basically make anything happen. Unfortunately, like I mentioned, I'm just here on a, a student salary. So I'm more interested in the, the free, open source, extremely inexpensive systems, which is probably what you guys came to hear about as well. Starting at the very bottom, the Ardu Pilot is the system that I base my drone on here and that I'm going to talk about for the remainder of the, uh, of the talk. But there's also some great uh, pro, uh, other projects out there. The UDEV board, Paparazzi, these systems have been around for a long time, especially Paparazzi. It's based on, uh, I'm not even going to actually attempt to speak on it because I'm not too familiar with it. But <laughs> it's been out there for a number of years and it's been uh, developed for several different airframes and utilized successfully. Uh, if you guys want to check out some of the other systems, I'd highly suggest you uh, reference this slide. Just Google these keywords and there's a wealth of information out there. So UAV essentials. Obviously, the first thing we want our UAV to do is to simply fly, to get up in the, into the air and, uh, and stay up there. This requires the, the plane itself to inherently have some stabilization and to be able to take care of itself when a gust of wind kind of tips it on its side or whatnot. And also to maintain you know, thrust and lift uh, greater than uh, you know, drag and weight. I threw the little physics block diagram up there in case there were any scientists in the crowd to kind of you know, give a free body diagram of how a plane moves through the air, but essentially what we care about is main, making sure that the plane stays up in the sky. Once we have that problem solved, then we can deal with navigation. Where's the plane going to go? And this really isn't that complex a problem, especially when we have GPS sensors, um, IMUs, and other devices that can give us a relatively precise location on the planet. And then, obviously, our third task is dealing with our operating payload. The whole reason we put the UAV up in the sky is so that it could carry something to do something useful. Usually sensing, sniffing, transmitting. On the plane I have in front of me, and I'll show a blow up picture for those of you who can't see, I simply just have a camera on. That's what we flew with yesterday. I said that camera feed looked pretty bad, but that was the, uh, the RF link. But it would be all too easy for somebody to create a, uh, a wireless sniffer. War flying has been done before, and those payloads can very easily be carried by this airframe here, or one that you could engineer. Uh, transmitting uh, signals would be very easy to do. Um, you can even mount lasers on pan tilt gyros on the bottom of these sensors, you know, in a, in a very small package, and basically do whatever you like. So that's pretty cool. All right, stabilization. So <laughs> wings level, please. There's two basic systems that are going to allow us to keep our plane up in the air, flying wings level, and, and relatively carefree. The cheapest, easiest solution is based on infrared sensors called thermopiles. As you can see there, they're really small. I don't know if any of you guys can see, but at the very top of the plane here, I have this black box. That black box right there just has four sensors on it that just uh, read the infrared differential between the sky and the ground. I'll talk about that next slide. The uh, second system that really aids us is an inertial measurement unit. Now, these are a little bit more expensive, you know, in the 100 to $200 range. And uh, they're, they're not that accurate right now. They're susceptible to drift over time. Essentially, they're just a mix of gyroscopes and um, MEMS accelerometers that are going to allow us to detect the uh, different forces upon the plane. That, coupled with GPS and thrown in uh, some control algorithms, actually gives us a very accurate um, idea of what's happening to the plane. And then we can adjust uh, making servo corrections. So depending on how complex you want your system to go, you'll either go with the infrared sensors or with the inertial measurement unit. So the thermopile-based the thermopile approach. In the upper right, you see the uh, FMA Direct Copilot. This is the main sensor. This is the one I'm using here. 
I think it goes for about $50, $40. It's very inexpensive.